The Lord our God is a welcoming God, standing with arms outstretched to those who return. The Lord our God is a seeking God, calling in love those who are wandering. The Lord our God is a hearing God, with ears that are open to our prayers of need and our hymns of praise. Please be seated and let us pray. Through this time we spend together, O God, may our faith blossom, may our hope be born anew, and may our love be made real through Jesus Christ our Lord. We acknowledge, Lord God, that we're very much like the sheep whom you characterized as having wandered away. We tend to put our heads down and follow one tuft of grass after another without lifting our eyes to see which direction we are going. We listen to the voice of other shepherds whose intention is to use us for their own purposes. We allow ourselves to get caught in the underbrush and rocky crevices of life. We take lightly the sacrifice you have made for us when you warded off the predator who would destroy our souls. Forgive us, we pray, for our wanderings and encourage us by your soft invitation to follow you in confidence and obedience. We come to you now in the silence of our hearts. Our God is a God who seeks and welcomes. He is the Father welcoming the lost son. He is the woman sweeping for a lost coin. He is the shepherd seeking a lost sheep. Do not hesitate then to come, for he has already been looking for us. We pray in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray, to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, friends. Bon matin à tous. Uh, je vous souhaite bienvenue. Je suis très heureux que vous êtes parmi nous aujourd'hui ou que vous diffusez ce service. Welcome to St. Andrews, everyone. Welcome to this time to connect, to connect with old friends and to meet new ones, uh, to learn about the teachings of our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Welcome to you all today. May the service bring you joy, comfort, peace, and inspiration as you leave. Some of you may have questions about our faith or our ways of doing things to here at St. Andrews. And to that end, I invite you to approach myself or Reverend Hill after the service. We'd be happy to, to speak with you about that. On the topic of Reverend Hill, welcome to the pulpit. I'm so glad that you're with us yet again uh, today so that Reverend Dimmick can take some leave with her family Uh, today. So welcome, Bob. And finally, friends, before we move to the responsive reading, there are a couple of upcoming events I want to tell you about because you don't want to miss them. First one is communion. It will take place on June 5th. Two, following communion, the annual congregational picnic is back after a couple years of being on pause for reasons we all know well. So that will take place out in the courtyard. That'll be fantastic. And finally, registration for our children's vacation Bible school will soon commence. And the Bible school will take place from August 15 to 19. And fourth and finally, before on to the responsive reading, there will be coffee to go following today's service. Norrell and his team, just through these doors, will have some coffee and tea for you to take away and enjoy and have a couple moments of social time as well. So let's now turn to the responsive reading. Uh, Today it is Psalm 150, 
It's the first refrain, and you will find it in this Psalter in your pews. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise God in the mighty firmament. Praise God for mighty deeds. Praise God according to surpassing greatness. Praise God with trumpet sound. Praise God with lute and harp. Praise God with tambourine and dance. Praise God with strings and pipe. Praise God with clanging cymbals. Praise God with let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord.
I'd invite the children to come forward if they are comfortable. And you can sit in a hula hoop at the front here as uh, we have a time of story together. Yeah, you wanna put those out for me? Thanks, Katie. There, so you can just put, have a, take a hula hoop and sit in the hula hoop. We just use these to try and space each other out a little bit. Here we go, in case anyone else comes on in. So I have a story for you today called Enemy Pie. I'm not gonna read the whole story, but I will show you the pictures and tell it to you. It's by Derek Munson, and it's illustrated by Tara Callahan King. It was going to be a great summer, the best summer. I was on an awesome baseball team, and I had just built a tree house in my backyard. It was going to be great until Jeremy Ross moved into the neighborhood right next door to my best friend. I did not like Jeremy Ross. He laughed at me when he struck me out in baseball. He had a birthday party and people jumped on his trampoline and he didn't invite me, but he invited my best friend. Jeremy Ross was the number one person on my enemy list. Now, I hadn't even had an enemy list before he came. Dad understood stuff like enemies, and he said he knew a way to get rid of enemies, and I was pretty excited about that. He said he would make an enemy pie. Ooh, an enemy pie, I thought. I can help. I'll bring some earthworms and some mud and some weeds, but Dad didn't take any of that. He wouldn't tell me what was in the enemy pie. I could imagine, though, what would an enemy pie do? Would maybe make my enemy's breath smell bad or make their hair fall out. So Dad made it, and I went out to play. It didn't smell very bad. It didn't smell very gross. But Dad wouldn't tell me what was in it. He told me I just had one part to play to make this enemy pie work. He said, I had to spend a whole day with my enemy. Even worse, I had to be nice to him. It wasn't easy, but that's the only way the enemy pie was going to work. So I agreed. I went to Jeremy's house and knocked on his door. He was surprised, but he came out to play with me. We played on his trampoline. We threw water balloons. He gave me lunch. I was kind of surprised at how much fun I was having with Jeremy. Then he came over to my house, and he showed me how to throw a boomerang. And of course, he wanted to come up into my treehouse when he saw it. But he was the only person on my enemy list, and enemies aren't in, allowed in my treehouse. He did teach me, though, how to throw a boomerang, and he did have me over for lunch, and he did let me play on his trampoline. He wasn't being a very good enemy. Okay, I said but hold on. So I went up and I took the list down and we played checkers and cards until dad called us in for dinner. We had macaroni and cheese, my favorite, but that was also Jeremy's favorite. Maybe Jeremy Ross wasn't so bad after all. I was beginning to think that maybe we should just forget about enemy pie. But sure enough, after dinner, Dad gave us each a piece of pie with some ice cream on it. Wow, Jeremy said, looking at the pie. My dad never makes pie like this. It was, a, it was at that point that I panicked. I didn't want Jeremy to eat enemy pie. He was my friend. I couldn't let him eat it. Jeremy, don't eat it. It's bad pie. I think it's poisonous or something. Jeremy's fork stopped before reaching his mouth. He crumpled his eyebrows and looked at me funny. I felt relieved. I had saved his life. I was a hero. But then we saw that my dad was eating the pie. Good stuff, he mumbled through a mouthful, and that was all he said. I sat there watching them eat enemy pie for a few seconds, him and Jeremy. Dad was laughing. Jeremy was happily eating, and neither of them was losing any hair. It seemed safe enough, so I took a tiny taste. Enemy pie was delicious. After dessert, Jeremy rode his bike home, but not before inviting me over to play on his trampoline in the morning. 
As for enemy pie, I still don't know how to make it. I still wonder if enemies really do hate it, or if their hair falls out or their breath turns bad. But I don't know if I'll ever get an answer because I just lost my best enemy. The end. I wonder if you have somebody that you think of as an enemy or somebody that you really don't like. I wonder if God can help you to love that person. It's one of the hardest things that Jesus tells us to do is to love our enemies. And it doesn't mean that we let people be mean to us all the time, but it means that we are kind even when it is hard. Let us pray. I'll say a line and you say it after me. Thank you, God, for loving us, even when we are not good friends. Help us to love others, even our enemies, just like Jesus did. Amen. You are invited to come down to Sunday School. You can follow me this way. And, uh, and then you come down and pick up your children afterwards too. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for inviting me to come to St. Andrews. This has been a very happy place for me, and I've met many good friends, and unfortunately have lost many good friends over the years. But it's always nice, and it was so lovely to hear a good choir and a great organist last Sunday. I had to run away last Sunday because I had a funeral in Carlton Place at one o'clock. So I didn't get a chance to say thank you to the choir and to the organist. A beautiful, beautiful ministry you have. Thank you very much for it. Now, as your power off, my power still off, I didn't get any sleep last night, so it may be my turn to sleep in church this morning, okay? So if I wander off, please be understanding. Speaking of wandering off, I heard a funny little story. There was a Presbyterian minister coming down this road and a Catholic priest coming down this road, and they collided at the bottom. And the priest got out of his car. He was in better shape than the Presbyterian. And he came over and he looked at him. How are you doing? How are you doing? Well, he said, I'm a, I'm a bit shaky. So he went to his car, and he got a bottle of Irish whiskey. He said, take a little bit of that. It may help you. And the Presbyterian took a little bit and it helped him. He took a little bit more and a little bit more. And after about the fourth little bit more, he turned to the priest and he said, uh, aren't you going to have one? And the priest said, no, I'm going to wait until after the police get here. <laughs> so don't trust those guys, okay? Reading this morning from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he has made his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your Father is perfect. Amen to this reading of God's own holy word. To his name be all glory and praise. And let us continue to praise God, singing hymn 692.
Let us pray. Come, O God, in the power of your Spirit, and open our hearts and minds to receive your word. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Some years ago, I had a tough time with arthritis. Those who have or have had arthritis know how it affects the nobility of your body. Your body is stiff and doesn't respond very easily. So you try to protect yourself from the pain by not moving your body. Now a physiotherapist came to me, challenged me to stretch my body. She gave me a set of exercises. At first I thought she was cool, unrealistic, and just out of this world. My body was in no condition to stretch. I finally accepted the challenge to stretch my body. It was a short step-by-step -step process and it really hurt doing the exercises. After a while, I began to make progress. Then my body began to feel better. Then, after the pain and the discipline all paid off, my body was loose and it could function. In Matthew's Gospel just read, Jesus is challenging us to stretch spiritually. He said it's easy to pray for loved ones and friends. It's easy to love your own kind and those close to us. Even those considered low life can do that. We can love within our little cells of like-minded people. What Jesus wants is people to stretch beyond borders. And this is so very necessary in our present world. At one time, we used to talk about a global village. We had hoped for a global village made possible by jet travel and, and high-tech communications. People for the first time were able to go and visit other countries. And we thought that the outcome of that would be that we would grow to know one another, to understand one another, and maybe open up into, you know, what we call the global village. But that's not what happened. It didn't work out that way. On the contrary, we are further apart than ever, retreating more and more into light-minded cells, creating a breeding ground for racism and bigotry and terrorism. Fear and suspicion is driving us to circle the wagons. Now, people can love one another, but only within their little box. People often call their cell a family, that we can love one another within the family circle. We can support one another within the family circle. We'll even sacrifice for one another within that cell. Groups often describe themselves as a family, a dance group, our dance family, sport family, fraternity, the police, even the church, we talk about ourselves as a family. We have common interests and goals and lifestyles, and we find it easy to get along with one another. We support fellow members in their time of trouble. The police call themselves a family, and they defend one another in times of trouble. Terrorist groups also consider themselves a family. They're held together by a common enemy. They can only function as a like-minded cell. And it requires commitment and sacrifice and looking out for one another. Terrorists talk about their comrades, about honor, about loyalty, and about caring. In Belfast, one Saturday morning in October, people were out shopping. And there was a butcher's shop. And this young fellow went into this butcher's shop to plant a bomb. The bomb went off prematurely. It killed people in the shop, but it also killed the bomber. Thousands attended the funeral of that flag draped coffin of the killer. Within his family cell, he was a hero. He was faithful, he was courageous, and he was sacrificial. The mafia called itself a family circle. You know, within that family, there's love, there's loyalty, there's respect, there is honor. They're very close to one another. They love their wives and their children and their extended family and their comrades. Races love one another as a family cell. 
within their box. They're polite, hospitable, they're kind, and they're generous. They have friends over for dinner parties, but the bond is keeping the races in their place. Even the elitists and the snobs can love one another. They may keep the underlings outside their gates. They may even be rude to lesser beings, but they can be good supportive friends within their own group. Even the religious can love their own kind. The liberals, the conservatives, the evangelical, the charismatics, they relate mainly to those with like thinking theology. The world has felt the impact of the religious loving only their own kind. None of these cells consider themselves as bad people. They all claim love, support, loyalty and empathy, but only in the context of their own kind. And that is as far as their love will stretch. Everything is tied to that tribal value system. Jesus commands us to step outside of the box, to love our enemies, to pray for our enemies, and to become perfect in the process. What does Jesus mean by love your enemies? It's not the intimate love of family. It's not the intimate love of a man and a woman, or even love between friends. We need those intimate relationships to survive. Jesus is speaking about what the Greeks call, I can be loved. And I'm not trying to be theological, but I need that word. It means an unconscionable, benevolent, and invincible goodwill towards others. To regard someone with Akabe love means no matter what that person does to us, no matter how that person treats us, no matter how that person insults or injures or grieves us, we will never allow bitterness against that person to invade our hearts, but will regard them with that unconquerable benevolent, invincible goodwill, which seeks nothing but their highest good. This is a different kind of love from loving our dearest and nearest. We cannot help but love them. But loving our enemies is not something only of the heart. It is all something of the will. We have to will ourselves into doing it. That means the determination of the mind. It is the power to love those we do not like and who do not like us. It is a positive approach to our enemies. And Jesus lays down this commandment as the basis for relationships. And it deals with people we meet in everyday life. It deals with national and international relationships. Its intent is to keep bitterness from invading relationships. That's important today because we live among different cultures. In Ireland, you'll meet someone from East India who speaks with an Irish brogue. Why Jesus said, pray for your enemies, for those who are different. It's very difficult to be bitter toward someone that you pray for. It puts everything in a different context. And this command is mainly only possible for Christians. Why? Only the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ can enable us to act out Akabe love. Only when Christ lives in us that bitterness and racism and bigotry will die and love will spring to life. We need Christ to enable us to live his command. Now should, why should we have to live this Akabe love at all? Such a love makes a person more like God. Bring into life the hidden image of God in us. It acts out the way God acts towards us. The love of God is such that we can never take pleasure in the destruction of those whom God has made. Why should we love this way? The Bible said to become perfect. Now that's quite a word, isn't it, eh? Because few of us are perfect. Why should we love? The Greek meaning of perfect is functional. A thing is perfect when it fully realizes the purpose for which it has been planned 
designed and made. A person is perfect when they realize that they were created and sent into the world, created by God to be like God. The character of God is I could be loved, a benevolent and positive way of dealing with other people that loves both the saint and the sinner, and it seeks nothing but the other's highest good. So people who understand I could be loved realize who they are and why they were created and have experienced the love of God in Jesus Christ and have stretched their lives out to live out that love, which becomes a love without borders. If there ever was a time when this is needed, it is now. In this fractured world of ours, people who can't step outside of their flags and their nationalisms, their cultures, their races, and their isms, and bind themselves to the larger humanity. Let me conclude with this little story from Northern Ireland. Two young men were friends. One was a Protestant, the other a Catholic. They were sitting on a little wall, chatting, when shots rang out from a passing car. The Protestant boy was killed, and the Catholic boy was wounded in the foot, which ruined his soccer career. The Protestant paramilitaries took responsibility for the act. Within their cell, they were heroes, protecting their culture. At the funeral, the minister spoke of the bond between the two young men. He said, they are the future of Ireland because they crossed their borders to a larger love. And this is what the world needs, for people to step out of their little family into that larger family. When black and white can take hands and walk down the street, when someone from the East and someone from the West, from different political cultures, we don't have to agree, but we can respect and love and treat that other person as a human being. It is Jesus' command that we do. It is tough to stretch beyond our borders, but the stretching is what brings the spiritual health and molds us into what we were created for, to praise God with agape love and to build a better world. Amen.
Thank you. That was great. That's keeping me awake, believe me. <laughs> you know, I do a lot of service in United Churches now. And one day they asked me, why do the Presbyterians use forgive us our debts and we use forgive us our trespasses? Does anyone ha have any idea why the difference? I finally found out. The Presbyterians would much rather have their debts forgiven than their trespasses. <laughs> Just to let you know, in case anyone asks you. Let us come before God, let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, beneath whose rule we live and in whose grace we stand, and all that is within us, we would bless your holy name. We thank you for the constants in our life, that the ground is firm beneath our tread, that day follows night, that the seasons march in predictable succession, that the gates of mercy are ever open to us in our need. We thank you for all that is new and changing in our life, for startling breakthroughs in the realm of science, for the audibility of people too long silent, and the visibility of wrongs too long concealed, for experimentation in the arts, and in particular, the art of public worship, for new people next door or up the street, and the prospect of contributing to each other's growth. Your ways, O oh God, are from of old, and yet your works are ever new. Make us grateful for the past and open toward the future. We pray this morning for the deliverance of people who are finding life to be a constant round of difficulty, trouble, and defeat. We pray for the deliverance of the homeless who have no comfortable place to lay their head, who have no family to welcome them, who are subject to the ravages of heat and cold, rain and snow. We pray for deliverance of those who are in chronic poverty, who for whatever reason cannot find the kind of work that will sustain them and give them a healthy pride and a reasonable living. We pray for the deliverance of those who are struggling with addictions, whether drugs, alcohol, food, nicotine, or any other substance which threatens to harm them and even destroy them. We pray for the deliverance of those who are held captive by compulsive behavior, who are prisoners of their own impulses, who are bound by inner forces they do not understand. We pray for those captive to stubbornness, which is posing as principles and which prevents them from taking in new insights which will broaden their horizons and deepen their lives. We pray for those held captive to illness. Traveling limitations have been placed in them. Energy levels have decreased to the point that their waking hours are getting shorter and shorter. We lift up those in captivity that you may break through in your spirit and set them free with hope, strength, guidance, and healing. We pray now for ourselves, acknowledging our lost readiness or much fretting or telltale tensions. Discredit the faith we profess and dishonor you. Renovate us, O Lord, through the tireless working of your Holy Spirit, until all in us that is unworthy may fall away and Christ rule unrivaled in our hearts. We come now in the silence of our hearts with our private needs and petitions. We remember people in hospital or people at home, people finding it difficult to function, people who wonder if they will see another day, 
the tears of families and friends. Work your will through us, O Lord. If not, your will be done through others. All which we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're trying to work out how to deal with the offering. Let's see if our plan works. All right, let's see. Let's see if our tag team uh, works today. Uh, thank you, uh, Reverend Hill, and thank you for the debts and uh, debtors. That was fantastic. I'll use that with my wife next time we talk. Um, but more seriously, our offering will take place a little differently today uh, in respect for public health measures. Rather than having ushers come through the sanctuary, we have plates, as you will see at the end of each aisle, and I invite you to to place your offering there at the end of the service. And for those who uh, prefer the electronic transfers in those conveniences, we have those options available too. Uh, we have options available on our website and you can uh, use those as well. Thank you. How did we do? I think we're doing fine. I'm going to say a prayer, just stay there, and I think we'll have done it. Very Let us pray. Having been found, O God, we seek. Having received, O God, we give. Having been blessed, O oh God, we bless. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we did it. <laughs>
farewell, friends in Christ. Return to your homes, secure in the knowledge that God loves you and that you're part of his family. And may you return again next week, having fulfilled God's purpose for your life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you.